Uh, last Sunday, we, covered, we started something for two Sundays. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. If you want to look in your Bible, it's on the screen as well. And uh, we're looking at four names for Christ in the Old Testament. In the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And I'm going to read out loud. You can follow along on the screen. Or you can follow along in your Bible, on your smart device, or in your paper Bible. And uh, let me read this together for us. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Last Sunday we looked at the first two, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. This morning we're going to look at the, the other two, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In Wonderful Counselor, we have one in the name Jesus who helps us with the decisions in our life. He's a wonderful counselor. He's a wonder of a counselor. He's amazing. And all of us at times, whether it's uh, professionally where we're paying somebody by the hour or whether we're sitting down across a table with a friend having coffee and just pouring out our soul, all of us at one point or another, we need counseling. We need to talk to somebody. And if you don't have somebody to talk to, I recommend our wonderful counselor who's somebody you can talk to, somebody who'll give you good advice every single time. So he's a wonderful counselor that helps us with the decisions of our life. He's a mighty God that helps us with the demands of life. Life is so demanding. Life is just crazy. Is your life getting crazier? Is it create crazier or are we just getting older? I don't know what it is. I, we're, we're, maybe both. Maybe it's both. I don't know. But it's just all of a sudden life has just gotten so crazy. And yet, in the craziness, we have in Jesus the mighty God who can help us with the craziness and with the demands of our life. This morning, we're going to look at the everlasting Father or the Father of eternity and the Prince of Peace. Now, let me give you a little background. Isaiah was a prophetic book that was written 700 years before Jesus was ever born, which is pretty remarkable when you read all the stuff in Isaiah about Jesus in the Gospels. Like you read, these things happen to Jesus in the Gospels, and they were prophesied 700 years before. Prophecy is the writing of history before it happens. And 700 years before uh, Jesus was ever born, God told Isaiah, write this stuff down. So he wrote down in, in chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall be with child, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And that verse is then repeated in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where it says a virgin shall be with child and will call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. And not to go too far down this trail, but in bibliology, which is the study of how we got the Bible, we've had the Old Testament. We had the Old Testament for thousands of years. But then when the New Testament came along, how, did you know, how do you know what New Testament books are supposed to be there? Why 27? Why not 28? Why not 50? Like, how did we determine that? One of the ways the early uh, church fathers determined what books were of God and what books were good books but not necessarily in the canon of Scripture was they looked at books that would quote the Old Testament. And they would say, okay, because that, that is uh, signing off on the canon, we believe that that should be in the Bible as well. So Matthew is quoting Isaiah. Matthew's in the canon. Jesus actually signed off on the entire New Testament in one verse of Scripture. In Luke chapter, 22, ch chapter 24, he's walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he said th that all the things in the law and the prophets and the writing concerning himself were true. Now, if you understand, and you're, we're going to get into this, actually, come back in June. I'm doing a four-week series in June on how we got the Bible. So that's the summer series I'm doing this summer. But just a little snippet, um, the Old Testament was, it's 39 books, but it's blocked off into the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's Psalms, Proverbs, etc. 
So the law is one section, the prophets one section, the writings one section. And what Jesus said in one verse of Scripture is that the entire Old Testament is God's Word. He validated God's Word. He also, and Matthew is validating the book of Isaiah when it's quoted again in Isaiah in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. So God told Isaiah, write this stuff down. Now let me give you a verse from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, two verses. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We didn't get this Bible just because some people said, hey, let's just write some stuff down. We got it because God said, write this down. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this book that I'm holding, that hopefully you're holding, is this book everything there is to know about God? No. It's not a spit in the ocean to everything there is about God, but it's everything that we need to know to know God, to know where I came from, why I'm here, where I'm going. And that is in the Bible. So God gave us enough Scripture to know how we're supposed to live our lives and how we're supposed to prepare for meeting Him one day when He comes back at His second coming. So God says to these prophets like Daniel, He says to Isaiah, write this down, a virgin will be with a child. So He writes it down. Okay, a couple of chapters later, He says, okay, write this down. Uh, a, son, a child will be born to us, a son given for us, and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's like Isaiah was looking down this telescope of time. He didn't know how long in the future, how far away in the future it was going to be, but he knew it was coming, and it was seven year, 700 years later where this came true, and this one who is Emmanuel, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. That's Jesus, Mighty God, Jesus, Everlasting Father, Jesus. How can he be the everlasting Father and the Son? Because he's a member of the Trinity. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus, one of his names prophesied in the Old Testament, is everlasting Father. And when he comes back at his second coming to rule and reign forever, he's going to be the everlasting Father. And he's going to be the Prince of Peace. So let's talk about these last two, everlasting Father. Let me talk about Father first and then everlasting or eternal everyone's definition of a father is different I didn't realize this for a long time uh, here's what God did teach me and and I think the Lord helped me with this in my personal life and hopefully this will help you we tend to view our heavenly father through the lens of our earthly father if our earthly father was patient and kind then we see God the father is patient and kind if our earthly father was impatient and unkind and ungenerous and stingy and selfish and angry, we see God sometimes as un unself or selfish and angry and not a good father. He is a good father. Some of you have had good fathers, so you have a healthy relation. You have a healthy view of what a good dad is. And if you had a good dad, I'm happy for you. Um, most folks had dads that were okay. Like they weren't ever going to be on Leave it to Beaver or Andy Griffith or anything like that. They weren't perfect, but they were pretty decent dads. They loved you. They played ball with you in the yard. They put food on the table. They paid bills, and they, they come, came to some of your games and some of your school stuff, and they were, they were pretty good. Some of you, uh, your thought of a father is tough. It's, it, it wasn't good. But I want to encourage you that the Heavenly Father is nothing like your earthly father. He's a million times better. He's always kind. He's always gracious. He's always loving. He's always there. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. So Jesus takes on this role. We're told in Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus is ever born, he's going to be called Father, Everlasting Father, Eternal Father. So let's talk about Everlasting or eternal, even the best of dads, even the best, are not eternal. We live in mortal bodies. Our bodies don't do what they used to do. Can I get a witness on that? Yeah. Um, I remember, I don't know if he's watching, I remember I used to play a lot of basketball with Zachary in the driveway. And I used to school him. I mean, I just took, I beat him. You know, I'd let him, I'd toy with him like a cat with a mouse. And then I'd just, boom. I remember the day 
I could not beat him. I remember it like yesterday. He toyed with me. Like, I don't know what happened, but it was payback. Like, I couldn't drive to my right. I couldn't drive to my left. I couldn't shoot over him. I couldn't go under him. He's just toying with his dad. And so after we finished playing that day, I said, you know, let's go golfing next time. Let's go. <laughs> let's do something else. Let's do something else. Even the best of dads and moms are not eternal. We get older. Um, and God in his wisdom and in his grace, we look after our kids. And then they look after us. That's the way it's supposed to be. Even the best of dads are temporary and limited. Limited in their health, limited in their resources, limited in their time. They can't be what the Heavenly Father is. They're not eternal now, if you know the Lord and they know the Lord, you're going to see them again in heaven. But it, they're not forever. I know, I know many of you miss your dads and your moms and wish they were here. And you'll see them again. But they're not everlasting. Jesus is everlasting. The Re Reformation Study Bible refers to this verse and says that the definition here of everlasting father is there is no need for a successor. Like there's no need for a stepdad. Well, dad died, so mom's remarried, so I got this stepdad. He's a pretty good guy, but he's not dad. There's no need for a stepfather when you have Jesus as your father. We learned this in our study of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 44, says, The God of heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Daniel 7, an everlasting kingdom. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For everything was created by him, by Jesus, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers and authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is the everlasting Father. And if I could wish one thing for you at Christmas, is that you truly know the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, and the everlasting Father, that you have a father in Jesus. Now, let me tell you what kind of father Jesus is. The son. Let me tell you what kind of father the son is. And if you want something to blow your mind, read Hebrews chapter 1. The father's calling the son father. The son's calling the father son. It's called the Trinity. I heard, I heard one time that to, to understand the Trinity, to try to understand the Trinity is to lose your mind. To ignore the Trinity is to lose your soul. So just know that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are three in one and one in three. So let me tell you about Jesus as an eternal Father. He is a foundation that never runs down. He is a fountain that never runs dry. He's a friend that never runs away. He's a Father never runs out that's who Jesus is Jesus doesn't leave to go get cigarettes and milk and never come home Jesus doesn't leave his family to go be with another family the Bible says in Joshua the Lord said I will never leave you or forsake you and Hebrews in referring to Jesus said I will never leave you or forsake you he is the everlasting father and I would wish that for you at Christmas and the last one He's Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Whereas the, mighty, the Wonderful Counselor helps us with the decisions of our life. If you like outlines, let me give you one. The Wonderful Counselor helps with the decisions of life. Mighty God helps with the demands of life. Everlasting Father helps with the dimensions of life. He's always there. He's always going to be there. And Prince of Peace helps us with the disturbances of life. Life can be disturbing. Life can be crazy. And all of us want peace. We throw that word around, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But it doesn't mean peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It means literally glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people God favors. If you know the Lord, there is a peace there that passes, un that, that, that passes all understanding. We desperately as a people, as a nation, as a world need the peace of God.
It's a very unpeaceful time right now. But you can have the peace of God in the midst of the craziest storms you've ever been through in your life. You can have God's peace that passes understanding. I shared this quote with you last week. Richard Pryor, who was a a, a very well-known comedian, movie star, a rough life, a self-inflicted, a lot of decision, a lot of uh, issues in his life he, he caused himself, and he admitted that. But here's what he said toward the end of his life when he's dying of an a incurable disease. Here's what he said, quote, There was a time in my life when I thought I had everything. Millions of dollars, mansions, cars, nice clothes, beautiful women, and every other materialistic thing you can imagine. Now I struggle for peace. I just want peace. And my hope for him and my hope for everyone is that sometime before he left this world, he met the Prince of Peace. I hope that for him. I hope that for you. Peace. Dave Barry. You know Dave Barry, he's sort of a Louis Grizzard uh, humorist. You ever heard of Dave Barry, anybody? Okay, four people. Appreciate that. Here's what Dave Barry said. My therapist told me the way to, to achieve true inner peace is to finish what I start. So far today, I have finished two bags of M&Ms and a chocolate cake. And I feel better already. End of quote. I read a report two weeks ago. It was just I wasn't looking for this, but I just kind of stumbled across it reading the news. They did a study of the top ten cities in the United States for road rage. Top ten. The number one city in the United States for road rage is Eugene, Oregon. Go figure. You would think it's it's New York City, it's L.A., New Orleans, Chicago. I've driven, if you've you've ever driven in Chicago on the Dan Ryan Express, oh my word, say your prayers. The number one city is is Eugene, Oregon. For every 100,000 people on the road, 500 people will have road rage in Eugene, Oregon. That's the ratio. They're going to get out of the car. They're going to try to run somebody off the car. They're going to to pull a gun and wave at people. They're going to ram somebody. Eugene, Oregon, don't go to Eugene, Oregon. (laughs) Or get an Uber drive. Let somebody else deal with it. The number two city in the United States for road rage is Atlanta, Georgia. Do you know that? According to this report, Eugene, Oregon, Oregon, For every 100,000 people, 500 incidences of road rage. Number two in America is Atlanta. For every 100,000 people, 336 incidents of road rage in our little hamlet of 285 and 85 and 75 and I-20 and 675 and 400. It's insane. We need peace. We need peace. I read this from uh, Will Durant's book, Lessons in History. In the last 3,000, he was an expert on history. Here's what he said, quote, In the last 3,421 years of recorded history on this planet, only 268 of those years have had uninterrupted peace, no war. So 3,421 years and only 268 of those years in a 12-month period of time, there were no recorded wars on the planet. And Jesus taught us in, in Matthew 24 and 25 that in the end days, as we get closer to the coming of Christ, there will be wars and rumors of wars and nations rising against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And it's unfortunate. It's, it's terrible. I know this is terrible to, to even say, but... We are so anesthetized to violence and lack of peace in our, in our own city that when you, you turn on the news at night and somebody shot somebody in a McDonald's, you go, yeah. We're, we're not even hardly bothered by this anymore. Because that's the world we live in where there is no peace. Isaiah goes on to say in chapter 57, verse 21, God said, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. If you live a life of wickedness and you don't know the God of peace, you're not going to have peace. It doesn't matter who we send to Washington. It doesn't matter who we send downtown Atlanta to the Capitol building. There will not be peace until the Prince of Peace is on the throne. 
Complete, utter peace. And if you want peace in your heart and peace in your life in the midst of road rage, in the midst of political anger, in the midst of murders, in the midst of crimes, if you want peace in a world where there is no peace, you need to know the Prince of Peace. That's the only place you're going to find it. And you will find in this cocoon of your relationship with Christ, there will be peace. There's two kinds of peace the Bible talks about. There's peace with God and then the peace of God. You have to have peace with God first before you can have the peace of God. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Philippians 4, be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's peace that passes understanding. I don't understand the peace I have. Right! It's peace that passes understanding. It starts with peace with Christ, the peace with Christ, with God through Jesus Christ, and then we can have the peace of God through Jesus Christ. Richard Swinson, a medical doctor, counselor, he wrote a book called Margins. I read this book. It's really good. Margins, Richard Swinson. Here's the subtitle. You know, they'll, they'll put a title in a book and they have this stuff under the title to try to explain the book. And here's the subtitle. Restoring Emotional, Physical, Financial, and Time Reserves to Overloaded Lives. Does that sound like you? Do you feel sometimes overloaded? Um, I don't know if, I know you can't see this, but th these are my notes. And every piece of paper usually has margins. Like, up here's margin. Down the sides are margin. On the bottom is a margin. But what happens is his point in his book is that we keep pushing the margins and pushing the margins until we don't have any margins. We don't have any financial margins. We don't have any money and savings. We don't have any uh, money in our 401Ks. We don't have enough money to pay bills, financial. Emotional, our relationships are not where they should be physical we don't take care of ourselves and all these things just keep moving the margins and all of a sudden we find ourselves on the edge of insanity no peace and if one more thing happens what causes road rage you know what these people are angry in their car and it has nothing to do with you they they have lost completely lost their margins they don't have enough money to pay their bills. They don't have enough emotional uh, strength from their relationships. They don't, their body doesn't feel good. Nothing is working. And it doesn't take very much to push somebody over off the edge of the table. And the way we rein in our margins is peace with God and the peace of God. I don't know when it happened, and I, this sounds terrible. Please bear with me. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I don't know when it happened, but there, I reached a point in my life where things that used to bother me, they just don't bother me that much anymore. And you know what I say quite often, and I don't mean it the way it's going to sound, but when things happen, I go, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Not my problem. It's not my monkey. Have you ever heard that phrase, it's not my monkey? There was a study, some people did a study at MIT, who owns the monkey? It's a business paper. And the idea is if you're a manager of people, that every day people bring their monkey into your office and put it on, try to put it on your desk. And that at the end of the day, you got all these monkeys doing all kinds of ugly things on your desk. And they've gone home and they're happy and you're at, you're at your desk with a tension headache. And the idea of the paper was when they bring their monkey into you, you kick it back and go, what are you going to do with your monkey because it ain't my monkey. It ain't my problem, and I don't care. It's a happy day when you start letting the Lord rule and reign in your heart and bring the margins back in. And you find in your relationship with Christ, you find that peace from the prince of peace. One of the things Isaiah saw was his name's going to be Prince of Peace. He's going to be the Prince of Peace. He's going to bring peace to this world. 
in the millennial kingdom. He will. Let me give you a, a definition here. Let me find it on the right page. Oh, I wanted to tell you this. This is good. There are three relationships that we have. There's God to man. There's man to God. And there's man to man. Okay. Adam and Eve sinned man to God. So God sent his son, God to man, to bring peace. So there's peace because of Jesus, God to man, and man to God. And you and I can automatically, with some work, but we can have peace man to man if I'm right with God and you're right with God. Jesus put it this way, John 12, 32, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. If I'm at peace with him and you're at peace with him, it stands to reason that you and I can be at peace with each other with a little bit of work. Peace. Peace. Now, the, the, the words here, Prince of Peace, in the Hebrew is Shar Shalom. Shar Shalom. It is the one who removes all peace-disturbing factors and secures the peace. End of definition. Charles Ryrie, in his study Bible, if you have a Ryrie study Bible, it's this, this is in the notes on Isaiah 9, verse 6, quote, Peace here is much more than the absence of conflict. It is the wholeness and integration with no issues left unresolved. It is a sense of wholeness, prosperity, and tranquility. That I am giving my life to the wonderful counselor. I can't do this. I don't know what to do, but you do. I can't do anything about this, but you can. I am temporary. You are eternal. You're the everlasting father. And I cannot manufacture, I cannot psych up peace. I can't make peace happen. He can. He is indeed the prince of peace. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If I could give you anything for Christmas, that's what I'd give you. You don't need another sweater. You don't need another pair of socks. You need, I need, my Everlasting Father to bathe me in this insane world we live, to shelter me, to put me in his arms of peace. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll say this here. Um, I've been working on uh, building a relationship with Juniper Truesdale. And I've been, I'm working slowly because she looks at me like I'm from Mars. You know, Derek and, you know, okay, little bitty cute as, cute as a button. So I've been kind of working on her, wanting her to be my friend. I want to be her friend. And this morning, I got closer than I ever have. I mean, I just like, I made progress. I'm, I'm excited about this going into 2023 that maybe we can be friends. But, I mean, she's like, she's, toddling around in the lobby after the first service. And I'm saying, hi, Juniper. And I'm just, I'm doing this, right? And she's, I mean, she's looking at me like, and I don't know when it was I made the step that was the ter determining step, which was a sixteenth of an inch. She turned around and threw her little arms around her mama's leg and said, pick me up. She didn't say pick me up, but that's what was going on here, Right? Think of me and Juniper. Think of me as the world. Think of Krista as the Lord. When the world's coming at you, a little bit at a time, pushing in those margins, you just turn around and you wrap your arms around the leg of your Heavenly Father and He will pick you up and He will engulf you in the safety of His peace. That's what I want for you this Christmas. And if you don't get a chance to come next Sunday for Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, Trace and I just want to tell you, Merry Christmas. May you have the best Christmas with Christ 
you've ever had. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being our Prince of Peace, our wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Thank you that, we, that this relationship with you is free. It's not like we have to pay a bunch of money for it or do a bunch of penance for it. Or I love that last song we sang. We who are nothing, we come to you who are the offering. We have nothing to give you, but you are, through Christ, you are the offering. So we come broken, scared, challenged, flawed. <laughs> we come just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God. I come. So this is my prayer for my friends here this morning, that you would fill them with wonderful counsel, that you would be their mighty God to give them strength when they don't have any of their own, that you would be the everlasting Father to them, the Father that's never going to run down, never going to run out, never going to run away, and that you will fill them with such a sense of peace in the midst of storms, that it doesn't matter what happens in this world, I belong to God. I belong to Christ. I belong to the Holy Spirit. And greater is He that's in me than He that's in this world. That's what we pray for Christmas time this year. And I pray this for my friends, that this would be their gift from you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.